Thank you. Uh, so my name is Nick Embleton and I'm going to be spending the next uh, 20 minutes talking about nutrition interventions to improve brain outcomes in preterm infants. And in this talk, I'm going to cover some concepts around what is nutrition, what do we mean by nutrition, talk a bit about brain growth and then something around nutritional interventions to improve brain outcomes. And just to note on the right side of the screen there, I have received research funding for a number of organisations including some industrial companies as well. And in the talk, I'll be touching on some of these nutrients towards the end that appear in breast milk. So the most important concept is to recognize that nutrition is more than simply nutrients. Of course, we need all the proteins, fats, and micronutrients in our diet. But in recent years, we've started to recognize the importance of all these functional components, particularly HMOs, growth factors, and other enzymes. In addition, over the last 10 or 20 years, we started to recognize the real importance of the microbes that live in the gastrointestinal tract. And these may be promoted by breast milk or affected by the NICU environment, but clearly there are other interventions like probiotics and all of these impact on nutrient assimilation. And then final part of nutrition are the technical or the socio-behavioral aspects. And this might be aspects of how we give bolus or continuous feed, uh, skin to skin, breastfeeding, sensory aspects of, of uh, nutrition. So all of these four components are important when we think about nutritional interventions. Now brain growth in early life is very rapid, but we're quite different to most other primates. In most primates, the rapid period of brain growth happens prior to delivery. But in humans, around 90% of final brain volume is acquired between 24 weeks gestation and two years of life when we as neonatologists look after them. And this is important because humans have a very large brain and in comparison to a rhinoceros that you see here with a very large head, but actually quite a small brain, humans have a brain that fills the entire cranial cavity. And when we look at body weight versus brain weight for all the different animals and note that these are logarithmic scales here, you see that humans are off uh, the normal line, that humans have a brain that is about 10 or 20 times as big as every other mammal. And therefore everything about placental growth, feeding, nutrition, and breast milk and early life is designed to protect and promote brain growth in babies. And during this period of very rapid brain growth, there are lots of very important um, aspects happening. So throughout all three trimesters of pregnancy, we have neuronal migration. We have the programming of cell death, apoptosis, that is particularly active in the second and third trimesters and in the first few months after life. Synaptogenesis that only really initiates towards the end of the second and the third trimesters, but continues until infancy, a myelination that may not complete until adult life. And we now know that there is good evidence to show that many of these processes are under the control of IGF-1 and in turn, intake of nutrients, particularly macronutrients, seem to impact on levels of IGF-1. So there are direct links now between nutrition and brain processes. Now, brain growth in preterm babies is vulnerable to damage, particularly cystic PVL and hemorrhage. And when we want to repair those tissues, the baby is gonna need higher intakes, both of the substrates but also the energy to drive these processes. Because humans have a very large brain with very high demands, it's therefore quite easy to malnourish these babies. And again, in more recent years, we started to recognize the importance of the cerebellum. And in fact, this undergoes much more rapid growth than the actual cortex of the brain. And studies have started to show how different growth of the cerebellum might be in preterm babies compared to babies born at term. And so there's altered development going on, as well as evidence of changes on the MRI. And the vulnerability of this growing brain to babies is particularly uh, important when we consider um, aspects such as nectarized enterocolitis and sepsis, when we get an inflammatory storm. And the various cytokines produce activate TLRs on the surface of the microglial cells. And then we get damage to the axons and neurons. Um, but furthermore, cytokines will suppress growth factors and particularly IGF-1. So how do nutrient deficiencies impact on brain development? Well, it depends on the amount of the nutrient, the type of nutrient, 
timing and duration. And you can imagine in each of those three different scenarios, you'll have a different outcome. So there are multiple nutrients. We're looking after babies with a changing diet, both PN and enteral nutrition, lots of developmental stages and lots of mechanisms. And it's important that we remember that none of these nutrients work in isolation. They all require cofactors, enzymes, and energy to drive the process. And therefore a healthy brain requires every nutrient. It's not the case that there's just a single nutrient that makes the difference. Now, demand for macronutrients is particularly high in preterm babies. Here I show you a photo of Vigan Banal who won the Tour de France a couple of years ago. And he consumes around about 100 kilocalories a kilo a day to cycle up and down mountains. In comparison, our babies on the neonatal unit require an energy intake of around 120 to 130 kilocalories a kilo a day. And therefore we are expecting our babies to do something that is about 20 to 30% more energy intense than the most intense sporting activity known to man. And most of that energy expenditure is happening in the brain. So energy intakes are particularly important in our babies. So let's just think about how nutrition could impact on brain development. Well, of course, we need nutrition for we need nutrients for tissue substrates. That's all of your macro and micronutrients. We need energy to drive the system, particularly carbohydrate and lipids, but also protein if there's not enough energy there. There's a whole range of signaling factors, mTOR. There's a whole range of sphingomyelins and phospholipids and IGF-1 that might be involved in signaling and growth factors. We know that lots of nutrients, particularly folate, B12 and iron, impact on gene expression and epigenetic processes. We know that brass milk prevents disease that prevents the cytokine storm that damages the brain. And finally, we're starting to learn the importance of the gut-brain access. We're only just starting to get an idea of how prebiotics and oligosaccharides and lactoferrin may impact on brain development in these babies. Now, all of you will recognize that neonatal care is very complex. And most of what we do is focused around cardiorespiratory management. But unfortunately, within all of this complexity, there is then a lack of focus on, on nutrition. And it's quite easy to fail to give babies adequate levels of macronutrients. So just as a quick brain cap, uh, recap, I've told you that brain growth is very rapid. We have one brain for life. The impact of nutrient deficiency on the brain depends on the amount, type, timing, and duration. The NICU environment is complex and poor nutritional status is common. And poor out brain outcome is quite common in our babies. And there is always going to be a question of whether this is due to macronutrients or micronutrients or something like this. I just want to show you this audit data we collected now uh, more than 20 years ago. And each of these yellow bars depicts the three gram protein intake that we would recommend a baby has on each day of life. And of course, now we're recommending intake close to four grams. But that, that yellow bar represents the three grams that the baby should be getting. In green, I show you the amount the babies actually get on each day. And then the red bar represents the difference between the amount they should be getting in yellow and the amount they actually get in, in green. So the red is the deficit that the baby gets each day. And if you add these deficits over time, you can see that by the end of the second week, babies have accrued a deficit of protein round about equivalent to about 60 to 70% of their needs. This is a huge deficit in macronutrients that the babies receive. And part of the problem is that on the NICU, all of your monitoring is focused on cardiorespiratory management. And there aren't any monitors or feedback systems that alert you to the invisibility of malnutrition. So what's the evidence that mal macronutrients matter? Well, I'm going to show you four bits of data quite quickly over the next few slides that link macronutrient intakes to developmental outcomes or retinopathy of prematurity. The first one is a study from Bonnie Stevens looking at 124 babies, less than 1,000 grams, where they used multiple regression to adjust the data for all the likely confounders, including illness severity. And what they show is that for every extra 10 kilocalories a kilo a day of energy in the first week of life, there's a four and a half point benefit in developmental outcome at 18 months of age. And for every gram of protein, there's an 8.2 MDI benefit at 18 months of age. The next bit of data comes from a large Swedish study of very tiny babies, less than 27 weeks. They also show that intakes are less than recommended. But what they showed was a tight relationship between the amount of energy and the risk of retinopathy. 
And what they show here on the left is that for every extra 10 calories a kilo the baby receives during the first four weeks of life, there's a 24% reduction in retinopathy after controlling for all the likely confounders. And the likely mechanisms are going to be complex, but are probably modulated through IGF-1, whereby low energy intakes further suppress IGF-1 that arrest vascularization and therefore increase the risk of retinopathy. This is a Norwegian study that was stopped early and was a postnatal nutrient enhancement study using both PN and enteral nutrition, where they gave higher amounts of amino acids, lipids, and DHA, and then they conducted MRI. And what they showed was that the enhanced nutrient group grew faster. They put on more weight, 16.5 versus 13.8, and they had larger heads. But the most impressive finding were these differences on the MRI. And here I show you in green the normal white matter skeleton in the skull. But picked out in orange here is the difference between the high nutrient and the standard nutrient groups, particularly in this one part of the brain, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is involved in motor control, perception, and language. And here is the final bit of data that links macronutrient intakes to brain growth. And this is a subset from one of Alan Lucas's very large trials where babies were randomized with a standard nutrient or high nutrient diet. And what they did was take babies or children who were neurologically normal at eight years of age, and they conducted a vesicular and an MRI at 16 years of age. And what they show on the right here is that verbal IQ in the high nutrient group is significantly greater at 16 years of age compared to in the standard group. So this is after an outcome that only lasted for a few weeks, they can still see a difference 16 years later. When they look at brain volume, it's interesting that actual overall brain volume doesn't differ, but you'll see on the bottom there a significant difference in the size of the chordate nucleus. And this is known to be an area important in memory and learning that seems to be particularly vulnerable to nutrition. So 16 years later, we can see changes in the MRI that relate to early nutrition. Now, there are lots of macronutrients and micronutrients that might be important here. Preterm infants are at risk of iron deficiency because of levels in low levels in breast milk, but also uh, frequent blood testing. But there's never been a good RCT. However, expert consensus is that you should be starting iron at between two and four weeks of age around about two or three milligrams a kilo a day, but you can delay supplementation if babies have had a recent transfusion. There are lots of other metals that are important. So zinc is involved in lots of processes, particularly involved in protein synthesis and IGF-1 expression. Um, we know that there are interactions between the metals such as copper and iron, um, and clearly other uh, components such as iodine are um, essential. But overall, there are no really good RCTs that will help us determine the exact levels. But we know that all of these micronutrients are going to be important in the diet. But there's no current evidence suggesting that we should be giving higher intakes to our babies. So the most important aspects of nutrition so far that we've touched on are the importance of macronutrient intakes and energy to drive the system. But in the last part of the talk, I'm just gonna focus on the importance of breast milk and why breast milk might be important. And for all these four potential mechanistic links between nutrition and the brain, this is really where breast milk comes into play. So again, this is data from Alan Lucas's studies where they looked at adolescents at 15 years of age who are neurologically normal and they conducted cognitive assessments and brain MRIs. And what they showed was that the strongest predictors of late IQ with social class, but also the amount of breast milk. So the amount of breast milk that babies had on the neonatal unit was associated 15 years later with verbal and full-scale IQ, white matter volume, and there was clearly a dose response effect. The more mother's breast milk you get, the better your outcome. This is data from a very large uh, French cohort, almost 3000 babies born less than 32 weeks. They show that these babies on breast milk actually tend to grow a little bit more slowly than those getting formula. And in this large cohort, they conducted neurodevelopmental testing at two years of age. And what they show on the right here is that babies who get no mother's own milk compared to some mother's own milk do worse. That as you go up, the longer duration of mother's own milk results in a better developmental outcome. So that babies who continue to receive mother's own milk for more than two months after NICU discharge 
have the best developmental outcomes at two years of age. People have often wondered whether supplanting uh, donor milk in place of formula milk, uh, whether it's a short form, might improve developmental outcome. And this was a study from Deb O'Connor's group in Canada about four years ago of almost uh, 400 babies, randomizing them to either getting donor milk or formula if there was a short form in mum's own milk. And the primary outcome of this study was neurodevelopment. And what I show you on the right here is that overall, there was no difference in developmental outcome at two years of age for any of the domains, depending on whether you had donor milk or formula. And if anything, there appears to be a very slight benefit perhaps uh, for babies getting formula. So no justification to give donor milk in, as a means of improving brain outcomes in these babies. Now, many of you will be aware of the critical importance of um, essential fatty acids, so particularly docose hexanoic acid and arachidonic acid with very high uptakes in the third trimester. Preterm infants are at high risk of deficiency because of the lack of placental supply and low fat stores and immature digestive functions. There have been a number of trials that are summarized in a Cochrane meta-analysis of supplementing LC poovers into formula milk but overall, there are no clear benefits that have been shown in this type of analysis. But there is, however, strong theoretical basis for giving adequate amounts of DHA. So people sometimes wonder whether we should just give uh, babies some extra. But here we need to exercise some caution. This was a study from Carmel Collins in, in uh, Australia a few years back where they supplemented babies with extra DHA, um, hoping that they would see a reduction in the incidence of lung disease. In fact, what they saw was a slight increase in the risk of BPD with additional supplements of DHA. And in a further trial published last year from a Canadian group, I think, here they actually gave the mother DHA supplements in order to increase the amount of um, DHA in breast milk. Again, they also hoped they might see a reduction in BPD, but they didn't see this. And again, similar to the previous study, almost appeared that they had more BPD and the trial was stopped early in the, in the mothers getting uh, DHA. So whilst DHA is essential as a nutrient, we need to be cautious about simply adding more into the baby's diet. But there is some uh, uh, hope in, in the use of fatty acids. This is a very recent trial from uh, Anne Hellstrom's group published this year in JAMA, where they took about 200 very small babies, randomized to additional arachidonic acid and DHA from day three. And they looked at ROP and what they showed was a significantly lower incidence of ROP in the babies getting the fatty acid supplement. So clearly we need much more work and there is reason to hope that extra DHA or arachidonic acid might be important. Um, and I'm just gonna finish off mentioning choline. This is a very important nutrient, a bit like a B vitamin. Uh, heavily involved in DNA methylation. It's a precursor of acetylcholine involved in neuronal proliferation and migration, but also um, animal evidence, particularly say in rats, showing that maternal choline supplementation improves outcomes um, in their offspring. And there have been, uh, has been a lot of interest in this over recent years. And Morag Andrew here about five years ago published this small RCT in preterm babies, but also term babies with brain injury who are randomized to getting extra choline, uh, DHA, and a nucleotide base with a primary outcome at two years of age. And here on the right, you'll see the differences. So in red, the differences at 24 months of age, which are the most important, showing borderline significant improvement for cognitive outcome in the babies getting the extra choline and DHA. Um, and that we felt was sufficiently encouraging um, that we should do a larger trial. So we have now plans and have funding for a large trial of choline and DHA supplementation that will recruit over a thousand babies uh, from about 30 hospitals across the UK, where we will randomize babies less than 28 weeks, or those with a term uh, brain injury requiring HIE, to getting a nutrient supplement or placebo with outcomes at 24 months of age. So uh, watch this space for the trial that hopefully will start early next year. Now I haven't covered uh, pre and probiotics or the gut brain access in this talk, but clearly there are lots of elements there that might be important and might link nutrition and brain outcomes. 
And I've really mainly focused on the very preterm babies less than 32 weeks, but I want to highlight that babies between 32 and 36 weeks are also vulnerable to malnutrition. And that babies born, for example, at 34 weeks only have a brain size that is about two thirds that of a term baby. So again, a very important group. So as neonatal care progresses, we get uh, better focused on the importance of nutrition. This certainly improves survival in our babies. But in turn, as more babies survive, the importance of nutrition becomes even greater um, and the challenges become more complex. So in summary, uh, very strong evidence that mother's own milk improves brain outcomes in babies, but that does not apply to donor human milk. Very strong evidence that protein and energy uh, do relate to outcomes, although there's likely to be an upper limit of benefit. Lots of theoretical reasons why you need to make sure the babies have adequate iron, zinc and selenium and some emerging potentially promising evidence around the role of DHA and choline, but we need more work. But in summary, uh, the two things to do are maximize mother's own milk and make sure you meet macronutrient intakes. And finally, you know, why is it that mother's own milk is so important? Well, we used to think that milk was just this inert fluid that you tip through the gut and produced a waste product at the far end. But we're now starting to understand the complexities of all the metabolites and immune processes that are involved here. And uh, many groups, including us, have got very interested in how these link between brain outcomes and other diseases such as neck. So as I say, we've started to recognize that brass milk is more than simply food. And on the left here, you can see all the different components that appear in formula milk. But appearing here in colors are all the things that you get in mother's own milk that perhaps don't appear in fauna milk and a whole range of uh, prostacyclins and fatty acids, phospholipids, nucleotides, uh, sphingolipids, lots of cholesterol and steroid compounds, lots of vitamins and amino acids, uh, but importantly, lots of these growth factors like IGF-1, IGF-2, uh, thyroxine, insulin, adiponectin. So breast milk really is incredibly complex and undoubtedly holds the key to improve brain outcomes um, in the babies that we're looking after here. And I'm going to finish there and thank you very much for your attention and look forward to taking any questions. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, just to summarize again, importance of mother's own milk and macronutrient intakes and to thank all my collaborators, both here in Newcastle and further afield who have helped us with our research. Thank you.